insurance agents from around the world. Hey guys, this is Scott Howell with the Insurance Guys Podcast. Hey, let's talk about client experience for just a minute. Guys, we have got to start meeting our clients where they want to be met, not where you want to be met. This isn't about you. Okay, I know we would all love it to be about us. It's about our clients. We've got to start meeting them where they want to be met. I understand some of you want them to call the office. That's great. For those people that want that, that's fantastic. Every year, more and more people want to jump on a mobile app. They want to download their ID cards. They want easy. They want speed. They don't want to come by and drink coffee and talk to you for 45 minutes. Okay. One of the easiest ways you can do this is through your agency branded self-service platform. Guys, that's where Glovebox comes in. A carrier connected agency branded tool for your clients. Call today, get a demo with Glovebox, mention the insurance guys podcast to get 20% off for the life of your agency branded CXP. Guys, let's go meet our clients where they want to be met easy speed. Have a great day. Hey guys, it's Bradley. Every now and then a company comes across my desk that not only blows my mind and what they're able to accomplish, but we implement that particular technology in portal and it completely changes the way we do business. That's happened a few times with a few different companies and it happened this year with Ascend. In case you don't know, Ascend saves agent time by simplifying the time consuming process of collecting payments, premium financing, and carrier payables without the back and forth paperwork integrated right into your checkout experience where customers can pay how they want credit debit ACH own the entire customer experience. It's branded to your agency and offer a modern checkout experience that your customers want. Ascend will also, this is the big one for me, automatically pay the provider, the carrier, the MGA. So you don't have to deal with the payables. It turns agency bill into direct bill. It combines the benefits of agency bill, owning the experience, with the convenience of direct bill. Don't have to worry about collections, payables, so you get the best of both worlds. And the best part is there's no subscription, no fee, and no cost to the agents. Stop wasting time on payments so you can focus on growing your business. Go to useascend.com backslash insurance, guys. I'm telling you guys, this is not just a promotion. This company is going to change the insurance industry. They've already changed portal. Use ascend.com backslash insurance guys. That's U S C A S C E N D dot com backslash insurance guys. Tell them we sent you. Thanks. Insurance agents from around the world. Welcome to the insurance guys podcast powered by glove box. God, I love glove box. My name is Scott Howell. your fearless host and leader insurance agency owner and insurance evangelist for i protect insurance and financial services based out of huntsville alabama and before we get started on today's episode please help me welcome he is a six foot three sophomore from Saraland, alabama parade first team all-american rivals five-star recruit he is a fantastic insurance agent and a great american ladies and gentlemen please put your hands together and welcome the incomparable Mr. Bradley Flowers. How are you, Bradley? Best I've ever been. Best I've ever been. Ladies and gentlemen, I got a song I need to sing for you guys this morning. Uh, If everybody could just hold on for a second, pull over in traffic if you need to. We are the champions. We are the champions. Bradley Flowers. That's pretty good. Announced this morning all over local news, U.S. World News has ranked Huntsville, Alabama as the number one place in America, the land of the free, the home of the brave, best place in America to live, Huntsville, Alabama. And I have one thing to say, Boulder, Colorado, suck it. Suck it, glove box. We're number one, Boulder, Colorado. You know why that is. You know why that is, is because the mayor of Huntsville made crackhead christy the the official liaison for new people moving to the town home of the fbi home of every defense contractor firm in the country home to toyota home to mazda home to polaris greatest place in the united states of america to live Huntsville, Alabama, folks the only technology and educational based economy in the state of alabama 
you drive 20 miles away from Huntsville, Alabama, and you're driving away from Raytheon and towards Crackhead Christie. <laughs> proud to be an American today. Proud awesome, to live. Man. Proud to live in the number one ranked best place to live in America, baby. Suck it, Boulder, Colorado. That's all I have to say about that. Bradley, we have most probably the most unique podcast we've ever done in the history of this show today. I guess we do. What is about to happen has never been done before. It's just like going to the damn moon. We've got a gentleman on this podcast today, ladies and gentlemen, that you are going to find very interesting. We are actually going to change his voice. I don't know who he is. Bradley, tell him. Do you know who he is? No idea. So don't call me and ask me. Do not call us and ask me who this person is because we do not know. But allow me to give him the introduction that he has always deserved. And before I do that, our mission on this podcast is to help people any way we can. Hey, you need to say he was born and raised on Twitter. That's exactly where he was born and raised. This guy's going to help us today. He's the commercial insurance guy. In fact, on Twitter, where he was born and raised, his name is at commercial insurance guy. Am I right about that, Bradley? Um, it's actually at some insurance at some insurance, but the name is commercial insurance guy, but I think you can search the name. And That's how I found you. I found you as commercial insurance guy. So without further ado, we're going to talk about commercial prospecting today and a lot of things related to stuff like that. But, uh, I want to go ahead and bring him on. This is just wildly interesting to me what he's been able to accomplish in a short period of time. He's a seven-year commercial insurance veteran. He was born and raised on Twitter. Nobody knows who he is. Nobody. He started an anonymous commercial insurance Twitter page as a way to share his thoughts with the people who are equally as passionate in the greatest industry in the world. I love that so much. He tries to oversimplify his processes so even on his worst days, he can execute and measure his results. He has several niches that he focuses on, including staffing, home health, commercial, janitorial, and commercial general contractors. And one of his strong suits is definitely prospecting. And we're going to talk about that today. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody in the insurance industry knows who this man is, but I give you the commercial insurance guy. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good. Thank you so much, Scott. What a what a pleasure to be here and to just talk to somebody else. I mean, how how cool how cool is that? You know, I'm I'm at, I'm, I'm two months I'm two weeks old on Twitter. You know, yep. so I was born two weeks ago on Twitter, and just the um the response I've received has been astounding. DMs from people all over the country, blocked phone calls where I've just called guys on block numbers because I'm tired of DMing them paragraphs. Right. It's It's been a whirlwind and I'm happy to be here. And, you know, my question for you and Bradley is, why do you want an anonymous Twitter profile on the podcast? Well, that's a great question. I think there's a certain level of interest, a lot of interest in what you're doing. I think uh, doing what you're doing, it just creates interest from people. But I guess before we get started today, how did you come up with this idea? What's the genesis behind this? And talk a little bit about your growth over two weeks of going from being a newborn up to a teenager. You're the youngest person we've ever interviewed. <laughs> yeah, you so, are by far. So so for me, you know, I've I've been on Twitter for a while personally, you know, so I love Twitter. I think it's a great way to get information out, great way to learn. I'm a lifelong learner. I love learning about businesses, entrepreneurs. And, you know, there was a, a profile that I guess the Twitter algorithm had slipped my way. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Strip Mall Guy. Mm -hmm. Sure have. Uh, That's the other one, Scott, I was telling you about. Yeah. There's a Strip Mall Guy and a car dealership guy. That was the next thing that was going to come out of my mouth, Bradley. So Strip Mall Guy and the car dealership guy. And don't think that you're going to go look for me in their following because I have actually unfollowed them on my per personal page. So, um, but, but strip mall guy, guy, car dealership guy, absolutely awesome follows. If you're interested in business, which, you know, Hey, we, we, we write business insurance 
you know, all, all of us on this podcast um, for the most part. So when you're in that sphere, you're constantly meeting with business owners, the stuff mm-hmm. that they have to say, you know, they're anonymous, it's, mm-hmm. it's candid, it's real. And just, mm-hmm. you peel back those layers that people try and, you know, hide behind of, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just really just, it's phenomenal what they say. And I started looking and seeing it. Who does this on the insurance side? Right. And there's a couple. I mean, there's some, most of them are like comedy accounts that are hilarious. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, but when you peel down to it, nobody's really talking about prospecting. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing you should do as an insurance professional is prospect. It's so funny that you say that I was down at Jag Insurance. They've got a wildly successful firm down there last week for three days. And one of the things that we talked about out of the gate was just how important prospecting is. And really, at the end of the day, I think Lewis Gazzatua and I both agreed. A lot of times we make things too hard. Sure. Mm-hmm. And, and it, as a young agent or, you know, even an older agent, if you want to sell insurance, prospecting is your lifeblood. That's mm-hmm. where it's at. The very first time I spoke publicly that was not, In a college speaking class, I actually gave a presentation on prospecting, which I'm sure was terrible, but I thought it was good at the time. And the ethos behind it was, is good prospecting make up for bad sales skills, Uh but good sales skills don't make up for bad prospecting. 100%. Don't have anybody to talk to. There's not going to be anybody to sell anything. You know what I mean? 100%. You can be the best closer in the world. But if you're only closing a deal every three months because you're only working on one account every three months, you're screwing yourself. Yep. You would be better off having mm-hmm. everything behind the scenes be a crap show and you your closing ratio is much lower than a, than a seasoned salesperson would be. But if you get the most butts in the chairs, figuratively speaking, right, you're going eventually what's going to happen. And this was kind of the presentation is. You're going to be so good at prospecting that you're going to have so many people to quote and to talk to and to write insurance for that the math is just going to work itself out and or your sales skills will improve based on the fact that you're talking to so many people. And that's what I was telling a guy that I was on the phone with the other day. He was asking me a, a lot of questions about, you know, well, what do you use as your CRM? What do you use to prospect, you know, with what database do you use? And I said, listen, bud, I'm. I make seven to 10 calls a week because I can't make any more than that. It, right. Sometimes I don't even get to seven before mm-hmm. I get three appointments. I can't, I can't do more than that. Right. There is that managing your time, uh-huh. but you know, even as a young producer, I, I want them to make 50 calls a day, but I, I'm also realistic that if you make 50 calls a day and in the course of doing that, 12 or 15 people want to quote, well, now we got to work on that. We we can't just be doing, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. So, so your guy's going to make 50 calls a day and he's going to get 12 appointments. Let's call them appointments for the sake of the argument. Sure. Even if it's fully digital. So, so he's made 50 calls, 12 appointments. So he's converting what 20 something percent of what he calls on. Right. Okay. So what does he work on out of those? What do you mean? Like 12 people said, yes, you can quote or whatever. Right. So is he going to get a proposal in all 12 of their hands or some of them are going to fall off the face of the earth, right? Oh, yep. exactly. Yeah, right, right. So how yeah. many of those 12 is he taking, you know, to the finish line, I guess, right. and either getting told yes or no? Mm-hmm. I yeah. like a, I like a, and my wife does this in her agency, I like a, either you have to make this many calls or get this many appointments. Yeah. I think her, I think hers is five. Yeah, those are training wheels for sure. I mean, yeah. you don't have to make fit. When you get good on the phone, I feel like if you've made a thousand prospecting calls or cold calls, whatever you want to call them, then you're going to be a pretty good navigator on the phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and until you've done that, somebody needs to have training wheels on you, just like what you're saying your wife has. Probably. Do you think commercial insurance guy, back to strip mall guy, uh-huh. Car dealership guy. Car dealership guy is fascinating to me because talk about an industry that has got a lot of strings being pulled in a lot of different directions. And I mean, it's an industry that has its own moniker. I mean, people say, "Oh, I'm not a used car dealer, right? You know, or not a used car salesman, or whatever." But kind of taking that and dovetailing it into prospecting, studying other industries and experts in other industries is one of, to me, one of the most fascinating and best ways to learn how to sell insurance better. 
because there's things that we do just because we do it that way. But then studying other industries, you know what I mean? Like you, you pick up things. Like I was reading a post from the strip mall guy and I was like taking all kind of notes on my phone and then like converting that into how would we apply this to insurance? Right. And you probably articulated my thoughts on that better than I could. So that's, man, that's the truth. And I, I saw one last week by him and it just hit home. I mean, think about all the independent insurance agents in the country. Okay, think about their principles. These are the partners. These are the people that are raking in the big dough, right? This is who we all aspire to be one day. Okay, how many of those guys in the country do you think hit the phones in the last Uh, couple weeks? Zero. Probably zero. Strip mall guy tweets out that he's been doing it for whatever, 24 years. He's closing $10 billion, whatever it was, a trillion dollars in strip malls or whatever. That joker put his calendar aside and hit the phones with his team all week. And he tweeted about it. Dude, that's. That's leadership, brother. That's That's leadership right there. Yeah, it's humbling. So, you know. That's a a guy that's wanting to pick up an AR-15 and and be the point man when we go out on patrol. Exactly. I mean, do you think he would walk into a a manufacturer that's paying $150,000 and bat an eye about asking for a BOR? No, he never (laughs) would. He never would. You know, one thing I've noticed about great agents, very successful guys, the David Carruthers of the world, you know, those kinds of guys that are just super, uber, duper successful. Studs. Yeah, Yeah, five tool players. They have great critical thinking skills. Not, you know, I always say this, competence equals confidence. And the ones I know like that are super competent. Not, you're not going to shake them with much. They're not, you're not going to throw something at them that, they, they, I'm not saying they know everything about insurance, but but they know their shit front to back. Mm-hmm. The other thing I've noticed is they have a level of confidence. They just don't care. Mm-hmm. You know, the, this, this self-esteem thing that we all have, the parents that told us that we weren't ever going to amount to anything, the coach that told you how awful you were, the boyfriend or girlfriend that, the narcissist that put all this shit in your head. A lot of people have so many insecurities that in their mind, they just start thinking about all the things that could go wrong. And I, I just can't do this or some, somebody might say no to me on the phone and God, that would just be awful. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like it's all these insecurities, the bully that took your lunch money or whatever. But well, your parents told you not to talk to strangers. Absolutely, stay away from strangers. They're they're bad, and yeah, you know, don't you know, you you might don't call him Scott because you might bother him. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I tell you, Scott, it's the high D, high C. Yeah, that's the that is the cold caller personality. Yeah, it's the person that has the power enough, the power high enough that yep. is assertive enough that they don't care about making the call. But then on the flip side, they, they don't, it's like, if, if they get rejected, it's like, okay, that's just one more no that gets me to a yes. Correct. And I can't Correct. take credit for that. I had a call with Laura Bruno 20 minutes ago and we yeah. went through somebody's personality. It was like that. It's um kind of what you said. It's like back to, to kind of childhood and that sort of thing, you know? Yeah. I was talking to Ryan Hanley one day and he was talking about, this was almost a year ago, but I, I think I was on his podcast and he was talking about, I said, what's your biggest weakness? And he said, cold calling. I hate to cold call. I don't like cold calling people. And even then I thought to myself, well, there's something mm-hmm. from your past that's creating an insecurity that in your mind, the thought of somebody saying no to you, to, that's rejecting you, this person's rejecting you. And in your mind, you just can't stand the thought of somebody rejecting you. And you have to somehow get over that. Would there's you agree? A, there's, there's a book out there, and it's called The Psychology of Sales Call Reluctance. Right. The book claims that there's like seven or ten different types of it, basically. Right. And and some of them could be anything. One of them could be your hard of hearing. And so you Ooh. can't hear people on the phone. And so you're always at, having to ask people to, you know, speak up. Repeat. And most people don't even know they're hard of hearing. Uh-huh. They just know it's uncomfortable to have, they just know it's uncomfortable to have phone conversations. Well, yeah, I'll hard, give you an example of, of, and it kind of ties into the reluctance with the prospecting. I worked with a guy for four years uh, when I was captive, who was one of the most respected, often top life insurance sales guys in this company. 
majority of the people at that company would still know his name today. He's passed away, unfortunately. And he, he, he was never like top two or three in the company with life sales, which as anybody here has ever sold life insurance knows that's one of the most difficult things in the world to sell. Mm -hmm. And he, he, uh, but he was always, you know, top 20, you know, hit all his goals, that sort of thing. And after he, he retired, the, the district manager was kind of asking me questions, you know, and I was like, dude, I'm going to be honest with you. He has the worst case of call reluctance for somebody who is successful than mm -hmm. anyone I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. And he's successful, even in spite of that call reluctance. Imagine if he whipped it though. He was that, and that's, that's where the, that, that was what led us to that conversation is the manager was talking about the potential that was there, despite the fact that he's our successful said the worst case he would, he would him and haul around and, and, and let's go to lunch. And then he'd get him a beer at lunch and be like, well, I've already drinking a beer. I might as well go home. Like he, anything in the world, clean his desk up, but he was so damn good at prospecting that it didn't matter that he sucked at this one thing. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it kind of goes back to, you, you know, what some, one thing some of you guys have heard me say with Scott before is, is did anybody die? Anybody die? I have a bad day. And I don't know if you guys follow Brad Lee <laughs> on Twitter, Brad L-E-A. -E he has a deal that I find really profound. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this test on you, Scott. If you've heard it, let me know. But would you accept a million dollars if I gave you a million dollars right now? Well, let me stop you right there. I have heard this, but I'm going to play along. Of course I would, Bradley. But what if you don't wake up tomorrow morning. Correct. So tomorrow morning is worth the meat. So when you put things in that perspective, it's like right. somebody telling you no or telling you to piss off or calling the police on you is not that big of a deal. Right. You know? we'll, put, we'll put it in this perspective and see, you know, how you feel about this. So me, for example, 45 calls a month and I'll get all the appointments I could ever ask for for that month. Couldn't work on any more business than that. And I'm. Uh, oh, and let's stop right there. Are you saying you do that? Yeah. Give, give me, give me your elevator pitch. You're calling me. I'm working, uh, one of these, uh, areas that you focus on. Okay. Pick doesn't matter which one. Yeah. So mainly in, when you're dealing with service trade contractors, you're going to get Gatekeeper. the receptionist, right? You're going to yeah. get the gate. I'm, I'm actually looking at your tweet right now that says, stop letting knee jerk reactions, get you off the phone with viable prospects. If you can push through them in uncharted waters, likely not swam by another agent in years. Yeah. So the, yes. Okay. So the gatekeeper, I almost called her the bookkeeper, the gatekeeper, her <laughs> job is what, what's her job? Scott? To keep the gate. Yeah. Keep you yeah. off the main man that's behind the door. Yeah. Don't let the main man in. Don't say anything about the main man. Don't tell them who it is. So people call insurance agents. None of the people that listen to this podcast are fall into this category. We're all smarter than the rest of us. We call and we ask who handles the insurance you know, I'm calling about your insurance right out the gate or whatever. And you just sound like a sad salesman, but nobody's ever called her and put her on the spot before and made her make a really quick decision. And just to role play with you, Scott, this is what I'll do. I'll call like, like I'm Brad, like ring, 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 ring. Scott you Howell, know? how can I help you? Hey, Scott, this is Bradley with Portal. I'm calling about y'all's commercial insurance. Are you the one that handles that, Scott? Actually, I'm not. I think he's here. I'm not exactly sure, but it, no, I'm, I'm not the one that does that. Right. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. And then you go into your thing, but most of the time when you ask them that they freeze because no one asks them, you know, Hey, I'm the one, you know, Oh no, it's not. They always say, Oh no, 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 it's not me. That's, that's John. Mm, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. So, well, now you have John's name. Okay. Is John available? But, mm. but I'm, but I, there's no like, buyer behavior for me is what I'm in love with. I'm not into sneaking around, going in back doors, trying to find, you know, I'm not going to call and say, Oh, I was on a call with John and I got disconnected. Can I get, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's a really good guy to go follow. And he does, he does cold calling live on YouTube. It's called the UK's most hated salesperson. And his name is Benjamin. I believe it's called the UK's most hated salesperson. He wears suspenders. He's real gaudy. He calls and, hey, hey, this is so-and-so, so-and-so. John's not in, is he? Yeah. Mm. The second you, you get that, you feel like something's wrong as, right. the, as the gatekeeper. So you're either going to you, – you're forced to make a decision either yes, no, or preserve that state that you're in. Mm. 
And so if you can throw somebody out of their state and they're going to start telling you the truth and feeding you information, then, then, you know, you're winning. You're either, you're, there's no losing in insurance sales, especially not in prospecting. You're either winning or you're gaining information for the next right. time. Pattern right. interruption. Yeah. It's yes. Yeah, pattern interruption. That's what I specialize in. I would say is uh, I'm not calling, I'm not calling saying the same crap that other people are saying. Right. Hey, hey, what was the other guys or girls that you said to follow? You said the strip mall guy, and who was the other one? Car dealership guys, real good. Well, hello there. Guys, excuse me for interrupting your regularly scheduled podcast, but I'm here today to get you out of aggregator and cluster jail. This may be the most important message I've ever delivered on the Insurance Guys podcast. Guys, are you a member? of a cluster or an aggregator? Does your contract have exit fees, termination payments, buyback provisions? It's time to get your freedom back and do what we did here at iProtect Insurance. Join the AC, the future of aggregators in our industry. Best decision we've ever made, guys. Best decision we've ever made. No entry fees. Small $200 a month membership fee, over 50 plus carriers for direct appointments. And by the way, new ones coming on board each and every month. You keep 100% of your commissions, profit sharing every year. Guys, we have made in the last two years, each year, our agency has made over $100,000 in profit sharing. Here's the best part, guys. And this is the part I'm the most passionate about. No termination or exit fees. You give the AC 60 days notice and you're free. You go get direct appointments wherever you want. There's no buyback provisions, no exit clauses. Guys, if you're a member of another aggregator and you have termination fees, buyback provisions, exit clauses, every single policy you write, you're digging that hole just a little bit deeper. And one day you're not going to be able to get out of it. It's going to be too much. You're going to be taking out a second mortgage on your home to try to get out of a cluster group. Unbelievable. Guys, go to acfree.org. That's acfree.org and register. Find out why over 650 agencies and $3 billion in premium have chosen the AC. And guys, here's the best part. But wait, there's more. Mention the Insurance Guys podcast when you talk to these guys and you get six months, that's six months of no membership fee just by mentioning the Insurance Guys podcast. Go today, www.acfree.org and let me help you get your freedom back. Have a great day. So, changing gears here a little bit or continuing down this road, you know, sure. one, one thing that I'm a, a huge proponent of is selling with stories. Sure. And I'll give you guys an example. I, I may have said this on the show before. If I have, I apologize. I, I tell the story a lot when I speak, there's a local chicken restaurant, chicken chain here called Fusakli's. Mm. God, you may be familiar with it. It's the most phenomenal, fresh fried chicken and French fries you'll ever get. It is consistent. Their process is brilliant. And this may or may not be a true story, but somebody told me this. So, so you go there, they're very similar to a Zaxby's or a Guthrie's. You get three chicken fingers, French fries, and a piece of toast. Well, I would, I'll go there for lunch sometimes and I'll throw the toast away. I don't like eating bread during the middle of the day. It slows me down, that sort of thing, right? Every single time do that. You, you get it regardless, right? If you tell them no toast, you still pay the same price. So I'd throw the toast away. Well, somebody told me a story that Will Fuziotti, the guy who started it, who is like this mythical creature. Nobody knows what he looks like, but he is like the king of processes and systems. He obsessively ordered toasters, like hundreds of toasters from all over the country. So he could get the perfect, consistent coloring on the toast. You know what I did the next time I went to Fusakli's? Mm. I subconsciously ate the toast. Ate the toast. I was halfway through the damn toast. And I realized, why am I eating this? It's because I knew the story behind it. 
It's right. because so, you had an emotional connection emotional with a piece connection. of bread. This dude. is why that's why I'm so big on content and telling your story via online social channels because people get emotionally connected to you and the people in your audience. But you have a tweet here that says, I have a short story analogy to explain what a broker or record letter accomplishes. I also have a short story or analogy that I use when someone tells me that their agent does a good job and they're happy. Now, since you're anonymous, do you want to share some of these stories so people may can learn from them? Yeah, I'm not going to share the specific ones that I use because they're pretty, some of them are pretty tailored to me, okay. but like we can, we can literally make one right now. They're not hard at all. Scott, yeah. you're, you're the animated one in the group here. So tell me, no, tell me about a situation where you had something that you were devoted to for a very long time in your life. And then you decided to do something a little different. And now the thing that you decided to try that's a little different has definitely taken the place of the other thing. And you'll never go back to doing it the old way that you did for 20 years. Oh, wow. Hmm. I would say working out for me okay. because I started working out when I was 16 uh -huh. and I always was, you know, go to the gym, lift a bunch of weights. And because I've gotten older, you know, the, the more people that you talk to that are knowledgeable about fitness and working out will all say, hey, when you start getting up into your 40s, 50s, you really need to stretch more than you work out. And then on top of that, I now use a lot lighter weight and I work out at home instead mm -hmm. of going to a gym because it it does away with those excuses that you have of having to get in the car and actually go to a gym. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I get so, it. I get so it. So that, that would be an example outside of insurance where I've done something that, you know, I'm stretching a lot more because I'm 50 now and I put a home gym. It's not much, but it's, it's doable in my house or the, building beside my house so i just walk out the door and i have no excuses as to why i don't need so to, work to out so there. to shorten that up to a compelling story analogy to use for a prospect scott if somebody's telling you look i'm happy with buying it from bradley i've been buying it from portal for 20 years listen i understand you should be happy as much commission as he's making over there you should definitely be happy with his service you know I used to not work out for 20 years. I never worked out or stretched like I did when I was in high school. But right. my life went on. I woke up every morning, the sun came up, and I've made a lot of money, and I never stretched, and I never worked out. Well, a year and a half ago, I got on this kick during COVID, and I started lifting weights, and I started um, taking care of myself, eating well, stretching, and getting eight hours of sleep, and my life has changed forever. Now, could it be that your relationship with Bradley is pretty similar to me stretching and living a healthier lifestyle. And there could just be something better out there than what you've been accustomed to. Mm. So we just, so we just wrote a story, one that I could use that I just came up with while, while Scott was talking is, you know, I've, I've worked at my agency for seven years and this is honestly a true story. I've used the same pen on my desk for the majority of my tenure unless I've lost it, you know, and then I go get another one, but the, we keep a stack of them. So they're really the same pen. Mm -hmm. I've used the same pen. And about two months ago, an underwriter dropped one in our conference room for his carrier. And I picked it up in the conference room because I didn't have a pen. I just had my legal pad in there and started writing with it. And when I came back to my desk, I threw away the, the pen that I've been using for seven years. Right. So the pen that I've been using was a great pen. It worked for me. And I was perfectly happy with it. If you would ask me, do I need a pen in my life? I would have said, no, I've already got one. Mm -hmm. But now I'll never go back because I'm using the pen from my carrier that I love. Insurance is just like that. There's so many people that are buying from the same agent for 20 years because it's just a condition that they live with and they like him. But let's be honest, they're not going to Thanksgiving dinner with him. They're not playing golf with him on Friday morning at 9 a.m. He's just he's just a nice guy or girl that, you know, gets him a policy, which is not hard to get. A monkey could get it. And we use that as a knee-jerk reaction when somebody says, you know, I'm happy with who I buy it from. We stop there and we say stupid things like, oh, well, it sounds like you've got a great relationship. Don't want to bust that up. Dude, they've never, they just give you a knee-jerk reaction like the other 99 insurance agents that have called. So bust through that, ask them some compelling questions. Well, you know, is it your brother? You right. know, do you play golf with him on Friday? What has he done? Has he, has he saved your bacon 
or is he just a nice guy that gets you your insurance and try to get fired early or get in the door? Right. Mm. I've done that. You know, I've done that the wrong way where somebody will tell me about their insurance agent and I just stop and I say, uh, I say something like, well, I certainly, you know, we respect relation, long-term relationships and yeah. we don't want to booger that up, but it's really, it might not be a long-term relationship. Right. It's your ego. It's your ego trying to, trying to protect you. It's trying to keep you alive. Exactly. One thing we do do a pretty good job of is if they are just adamant about staying where they are, say, look, I don't have to be your number one. I just want to be your number two choice. Sure. Because one, and that's, and one that's, day something's going to screw up. Somebody's going to mm-hmm. screw something up and you're going to be looking for insurance. That's right. But, and there's no, there's no right way or wrong way to prospect. There's no right way or wrong way to sell insurance. I think where we mess up as insurance agents is, you know, we, we look and we think Scott Addis is going to shoot us that silver bullet. And it's just going to change oh our life in, in one weekend or, you know, we go watch David Carruthers on YouTube and think, man, I'm going to go out there and do a million dollars in revenue next year because David's, you know, osmosis me over here. Or, yeah. you know, you, you read the wedge and think you're a hero or something. Or, you know, you go to Sandler sales training sponsored by some carrier, right. you know. Dude, and, everybody's and, looking for a silver bullet. Exactly. Everybody. There is none, dude. Get on they, the phone for two years. Have have the dang meat sweats behind the phone, yep. you know, shake and tremble because you're afraid somebody's going to cuss you out and do that a thousand times. And at the end of the day, you'll be a wizard. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. it's kind of like, you know, I've told the story where, you know, a lot of agents through the podcast reach out to us and I would have people reach out and ask, I'm trying to grow in a niche. I'm trying to become the mayor of my village or I'm trying to do whatever. Right. Yeah. Sure. And I would, and I, I tend to a- answer questions in ways that I best see fit for me and in ways that I've sure. done. And a lot of them, I would say, Hey, I think you should do a podcast in your niche. You know, if your niche is contractors, do a podcast for contractors. If you want to be the mayor of Springfield, Missouri, do the Springfield, Missouri business. And I would like lay this thing out for them and nobody would do it. Yeah. Like literally nobody did it. And it's because they were looking for that. Oh, yeah, I don't want to do anything. I have to work. They don't really want to do no. the hard work. No, exactly. They just, they just want the silver bullet. And honestly, that might be one of my main reasons for staying anonymous is because I don't want to attract the people that are just wanting to get a little quick hit of the cocaine and then yep. trying to make a million bucks. I'm interested in the people that are scouring the, the deep depths of the Twitterverse looking to get better. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I agree with what the two of you are saying right now uh, relative to Bradley's point about all the people he and I have told about starting a podcast, but I think it goes deeper than that. I think that psychologically what I see people do when it comes to podcasting specifically and social media, again, guys, we're going back to psychology of self-esteem you know, hanging it out there. And I think a lot of people have a very hard time hanging it out there and getting Mm -hmm. on video. And they want to find all the reasons why they can't do that because deep down inside, they can force themselves to do it maybe once or twice. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen people do that where they'll, 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 you know, get all the podcasting equipment and they'll do one or two podcasts, but then that motivation kind of wanes off and they let all those insecurities come back in and it's, then they start that thing. Well, I'll do it next week. I'll do it Mm -hmm. next week. Kind of what you were talking about earlier, Brad. Look, when we first started this podcast, tell the story, my insecurities were absolutely through the roof. Petrified. Tell them the story about the, the guy that you were on the bridge doing the video and he wrote something, you know, you were doing a Periscope video. You oh, remember yeah, that yeah, story? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, and yeah, you, I, and you, Bradley Flowers told yourself that day, I am never doing another video. It was back when, back, this was like 2015, 2014 probably was when Periscope launched. Periscope mm-hmm. was the first live streaming platform and it yep. was connected. I don't know that Twitter owned it yet. I think Twitter ended up buying them. Uh, it was only on Twitter and it was so niche. Like you could pull up a heat map of the United States and there'd be three people live. Right. And so you would do a live video and you would have freaking 10,000 people. people on yeah. there. I mean, just like that, you know, right. 
that was the platform that actually kind of created a little bit of a vacuum for some of the Grant Cardones and people like that, that, that Mm -hmm. when the time they were blowing up and Meerkat was another one, Meerkat, in my opinion, was the better of the two, but I went live for the first time and I was driving down the causeway and was filming the, the sunset and somebody commented like effing loser or something like that. And I immediately shut it down and like, for like a solid 10 months, I could not fathom putting myself on camera. Could right. not even think about it. And then it took me a whole year and I missed the window. By right. that point, a bunch of people were doing live stream, a bunch of people were doing video. And I'll be, obviously it still kind of worked out. But when we started this podcast, I was so insecure because I didn't want people that I knew who were way better insurance agents than me, which there still many are many of those. And there always will be. That it always will be thinking, who's this guy think he is? Yeah. And yeah. you know what happened? I got over it. You got over it. You, you got know why you it. got over it? Because you did it a lot. And you ended it, up, it's I, like, it, you know, the first time you get on a bicycle as a kid, you're like, I'm going to fall off this damn bicycle. But the, mm-hmm. the third month you've been riding it, you chit your doing jumps and riding all over. It, it's the same thing. Prospecting is the same way. If I was, yeah. and, and the only reason why I said 45 calls a month, Scott, is because I was going to quantify that and simplify it. If I do, if I make 45 calls a month, I promise you, I will close $10,000 in revenue based on those calls that I made in that month. Now, if you divide that out, that's over $200 a cold call, brother. Yeah. So if yeah. I'm sitting there handing you a $200 bill, just yeah. to dial a stranger on the phone, we would all do it, wouldn't we? Right. It's a delayed gratification game, man. If you can just simplify it, get it in your head that you're printing money over here when you dial strangers, then yep. you're not worried about if Joe Blow hangs up on you. They hang so, up on they're hanging up on you because somebody somebody has taught them how to treat people poorly. Right. And it, it's not a reflection on you or anything you're doing. You could call them about handing them a ten thousand dollar check and they're gonna still hang up on you yes so let me let me ask you this yeah. part two step two in your cold calling okay we've gotten through the gatekeeper however you want to do that you know whatever means necessary uh yeah i mean there's no i mean there's no seat there's no magic bullet on that man you just gotta call and start asking eventually you have to unmask yourself and tell them why you're calling right and i'm I'm, oh, I'm, calling, so- I'm calling because you were new and I'm curious, have you ever met with another insurance person? And there you go. Discuss your renewal. Well, that was hard, wasn't it? No, yeah, it's simple. It's, it's <laughs> stupid. <laughs> yeah. And then that kicks the ball off the tee. We're either going to have a discussion. Yeah. He's gonna, he's gonna, he or she is going to sell you, young agent, on why he doesn't or she doesn't need to speak to you. Exactly. Gonna, they're either going to sell you on that or you're going to sell them based on your product knowledge, confidence, Personality, sure. all of that why would be a great reason for you to let us be you know give you a second look exactly ask questions that blow the freaking deal right. say things that blow the deal right ask questions that blow the deal do they say things that you know make you cringe when they come out of your mouth because you know they might squash you when it comes out of your mouth and say yeah you're right that's not yeah that's yeah not. I appreciate you calling, but we're, we just, I just couldn't stand the thought of leaving Scott Howell. I mean, he, right. he's my deacon at church. And, you know, when my mom mm. died, he was there at the funeral. And there's just no way that I could call Scott Howell. Dude, save yourself. It's yeah, self preservation. That's what prospecting is all about. Right, right. So let me ask you a question, commercial insurance guy, that sure. nobody knows who you are. Sure. I'm going to go through one of your tweets here. Okay. This, this is the good stuff right here, guys. I I'm hope back y'all are- I hope y'all are taking notes. So this is a tweet, anonymous tweet from my boy that's on the podcast today. Good commercial producer versus bad commercial producer, a thread. Number one, a good producer blocks his time to prospect. A bad producer says they can't prospect because they are slammed. Oh, yeah. We just talked about that. You got to carve out time. You got to carve out time to keep butts on the Ferris wheel all the time. You can't yeah. be so focused on all this new business that you're that you're trying to write that you don't you just stop prospecting because when that person either buys or doesn't buy from you, you need to have another one in the in, in the spot to replace them. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Next one: a good producer tracks revenue and speaks revenue. A bad producer tracks premium and speaks premium. Yeah, pre- I mean premium is what the carrier 
charges the customer. Right. Re- revenue is what you get paid. You're the agent. You talk about revenue. Quit making yourself feel good by boasting about premium. Drill down and let's talk about the real deal, the commission. A good producer has a minimum revenue that they will work on. A bad producer can justify uh, riding the tiny ones, air quotes, because they can grow to be big. Yeah, exactly. I mean, everybody, you know, at my office, it, people will talk about, you know, one account that was a walk-in that then grew to pay $75,000 in premium. And that's why we justify riding an, all and these. that's an anomaly. That's an anomaly. Sure. That's it. That's everywhere. And right justify you know those accounts with you know with the ones that we end up writing that are going to cancel in three months due to non-payment is your you know? minimum revenue per producer thousand dollars i think it should be yeah i think i think it should be i think that's the starting point i mean a lot of these shops especially these private equity owned shops they're 3500 5, i mean right I think there's some bigger ones that I'm not going to list their name that are sure. well, very well known nationally. I mean, man, that's 7,500 in revenue and up. I know a guy that was at a really large regional, and their minimum revenue was fifteen thousand dollars in revenue. He had he had five accounts in his hometown he could go after. Right. You know, ne- but, ne- but yeah, a thousand. I think a thousand is a minimum, man. Yeah, anything under that, it's a house. Yeah, I mean, what are you making? Th- Three hundred bucks as a producer, dude. Yeah. I won't. Uh, there's a lot I won't do for 300 bucks. Yeah, right. Next one. A good producer asks the prospect who the agent is currently and finds out why they buy from them. And then air quotes, know the competition. A bad producer is scared to bring up the other agent. Yeah, if they won't tell you, Scott, who they buy from, they're not going to leave that person because they're scared of them. So right. that's that's a self-preservation tactic that I use is if you can't tell me who you buy it from and, and you know, what their name is, you're too scared to share that information with me. It's going to be, I mean, how hard is it going to be when I ask you for your policies right. and I sit down and then ask you to fire that imaginary person? You're not going to do it. Nobody will. Next one. A good producer knows that insurance is hard as crap, but there is a, always a fix. A bad producer relishes on the tough days and throws pity parties for themselves oh yeah and we all know i mean in yeah. the the parody in all of this is i've been that bad producer at times that's why it was so easy we all have. for me to talk nobody's about. perfect yeah we all have yeah i can tell you the years that i was the bad one the years that i was the good one you know good producers understand that their actions and decisions control their destiny i did a video on this posted it on twitter the other day Good. Pro- Let me say it again. Good producers understand that their actions and decisions control their destiny. Bad producers make excuses as to why they have gotten shafted or screwed over. Yeah, I mean, we've all heard it. We've all heard it from our, out of our own mouths and from other guys that you work with or work for you on reasons why they didn't get deal. I would have got that deal, but, you know, it is yeah. politics and all that. Well, quit mm-hmm. playing the politic game. Yeah. And, and, well, and just own it. It's like we lost a deal one time early in Portal, commercial deal to one of Scott's buddies. Not really, but somebody Scott knows who basically lied to keep the deal. And I wallowed in it for an hour. And then it kind of hit me. It's like, you know what? If somebody has to lie to the customer to keep me from winning, I'm already winning the long game, you know? Oh yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, and that, it's none of the agents listening to this podcast, but right. the incumbents will lie, steal, and cheat. If mm-hmm. you were taking Bradley, if I was taking a ten thousand dollar bill out of your pocket, you'd scratch and claw a little bit for it, wouldn't you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I mean, so will that other guy, and and, and they might not have as good of ethics or morals as you do. Yep, there's a good one. Good producers have a big month and immediately go back to try and replicate that month. Bad producers have a big month and spend two months bragging about that month. I think we've all been there. That one hits home hard, right? You know, oh man. Hey, let me ask you a question. Let me ask yeah. you a question. Yeah. When you have a big month, do you go back mentally and study your mind, your mindset, what you were doing that month that made you that successful? Well, it's really not that month. It's probably what I did 60 days prior to that. Yeah, that's, exactly. what, I, yeah, that's, what, that's what I meant. Not the month you did it, but the but, two but months But yeah, I, Yes, I will. I will. I always do a look back 
and see, okay, what was I doing in my personal life at the time? Right. What was I doing at work? You know, what were the actions that I made? I feel like I try to devote, if I can devote 70 to 80% of my time prospecting, cl- trying to sell. So prospecting, selling, or working with my top accounts, like top revenue generating accounts. Right. Then, then I'm going to be successful because of, you know, just getting introductions. And then on top of that, prospecting is such a huge thing that I do, you know. So, yeah, I look back at probably 60 days prior to that month and just make sure that, you know, my my activity was good. And the data always reflects it. I mean, the score takes care of itself, dude. Right. When right. you're doing that, when you're doing the little things right, the scoreboard lights up every time. I don't think there is anything in insurance more important than prospecting. It's not, there's not at all. I don't, all. Think, I don't believe. And, that, yeah. and that's what, that's where Lewis guys, and I landed on it last week. We both said there's just nothing more important than that. Very few insurance agents have problems selling and closing. I, yeah. Very few do. Most of them are nice people. They can get in there and close a piece of business. I right. think the majority of us have a prospecting problem. Right. Well, it's kind of like you have, I, I don't know if you guys are on TikTok. I mean, I know Scott's on TikTok, but I am very firmly, squarely, the TikTok algorithm has me pegged on bourbon TikTok. <laughs> and you get these people on there and they're making fun of the bourbon snobs that make fun of all of the new bourbon drinkers for their selections. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I feel like in our industry, we have coverage snobs Mm -hmm. and you see it very prevalent in some of the insurance groups that try to try to make themselves look like the better insurance agent because they understand all the coverages. But I think a lot of times those are the people that sit around and don't get anything done, Mm -hmm. but I know more about it than you do. You know what I mean? It's the people that are going to tell you how to do it rather than show you how to do it. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's another form of car reluctance is people that, you know, I don't know enough information. I can't possibly call this person and sell this industry because I don't, you know, everything and what little coverage forms they need and all that, man, there are some studs out there that have no designations that are just trained. Oh, dude, don't even get me freaking started on designations. And I'm about, and I'm going through the CIC, but, and this will tell you how I feel about it. I'm doing it to further my education so I can help my customers, not so I can add it to my LinkedIn profile. Sure. And and if you, you put me up against somebody that has a risk management degree and a CIC and all that, and I'm still probably going to win as long as I run my process the right way. And that's the same for all of us. What I is, mean, tell me your process. What is it? And my process is, is simple. I try to, if I, if I was trying to simplify it for you guys, it would be, do the work beforehand and, and actually do the work, dial the numbers prospect, get fired early, ask compelling questions that get you fired. And at the end of the day, if you don't get fired, they hire you, brother. That's it. If you get to the finish line and it's time to sign, you don't have to ask anybody to sign pay for it. They know that's what you're doing. I understand. You know, because when you've gone along the whole, you know, that whole roadmap and you're and you've given them every opportunity to let you go away and they never do they're your customer man you got them so guys before we get off this podcast i'm gonna tell a very short story let's hear it and i really appreciate you being here today anonymous it means a lot it means a lot commercial insurance guy i told this story to some new producers down at jag insurance last week and i'm gonna tell it to our listening audience and i apologize if i've told it before in uh, 2008, I went to Nashville Auction School to become an auctioneer. I wanted to learn how to bid call. And I was the president of my auctioneer class. And I did graduate. And I'm okay at bid calling, but not great because I don't do it every day. So start them along and how much for it'll give me 10 bill and now he'll give me 15. 15 bill and it'll give me 20, 20 bill and 20 now buy 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 20 now he'll give me 25. That kind of stuff, right? He does that so casually, like that kind of <laughs> the, stuff. That, that yeah. expert auctioneering I just did. Right. The very first day of class, the instructor had every person in the class, and there was probably 25 or 30 people there, get up at the podium, introduce themselves, tell where they were from, what they did for a living, just a couple of, you know, typical things. And as everybody's going up there, this boy walks up to the podium. 
and his name was Jeff. Jeff lived in Brentwood, Tennessee, which is a very high upper class part suburb of Nashville. And he had a very successful antique business. He would sell what he would do is he'd go over to Europe twice a year and bring shipping containers of antiques back, mark them up and sell them to, you know, country music stars and, and, and rich people up in the Nashville Brentwood Franklin area. Jeff walks up to the podium and he stands there for a few seconds and he says, I need to tell everybody here something. I don't believe I'm going to be able to go through this course. I think today is going to be my last day. And the reason I can't go through this course is I am absolutely petrified of speaking in front of people. And the thought of me bid calling in front of people, I, I can't even fathom doing that. And I think, I think, I just don't think I can do this. And I think today's going to be my last day. And the lead instructor for the Nashville auction school stood up and he raised his hand and he said, Jeff, can I ask you a question? And the guy and Jeff said, yeah, you can ask me a question. He said, what are you willing to give up to be successful? Are you willing to give up the fear that you have about speaking and talking in front of people to finish this class and be successful? Or are you going to let that fear get the best of you and go home? That's the question. That's the crux of the issue. What are you willing to give up to be successful? And I tell young agents that today because that applies to everything we just talked about in prospecting. Are you willing to give up the self-esteem issues, the feelings of inadequacy, the feelings of not wanting anybody to reject me because if I get rejected, that's a problem for me from a psychological st- Are you willing to give all that up? to reach your goals and become the insurance agent that Bradley and myself know that all of you can be. Would you agree or disagree, Mr. Commercial Insurance Guy? 100%. Couldn't have said it better myself. And one piece of advice, bring somebody in the fold. If you're struggling with it, tell somebody. Tell somebody that works with you. Tell somebody that you love. You know what? You bring up a great point because the way to flush out your insecurities is to admit them and talk through it with somebody. And, mm-hmm. and, and when I say admit them, I mean verbalize them from your mouth to someone else. Right. That kind of kicks the ball off the tee to kind of start getting past some of those things is to actually speak them out into the world. I know that sounds hokey, but that's the starting line. You know, when you don't tell people your deepest, darkest secrets and things that bother you. and are it, seems like such, it seems like such a bigger deal than it really is when you're right. holding in and you're the one living with it by yourself. That's exactly right. We love you. We appreciate you being on the show. As I end every podcast, rewards come from action, not discussion. Get your ass out from behind that desk today. Go out into the big, bad world. Speak your truth. Get rid of your insecurities. I know you, mom and dad. I know your dad. He was an alcoholic. He told you what a worthless piece of shit you were. You had a boyfriend one time tell you that, you know, whatever they told you, whatever the bully told you, whatever the the guy that wrote something under your Periscope video that said you're a piece of shit, you don't shouldn't be Periscoping. And then Bradley had this insecurity for 10 months that he shouldn't have had. But you got to get past that. And the reason why is because you got to make money for your family, for your wife, for your husband for your kids' college fund, for your parents that are struggling out there. Go make money for them today. Write good business for the companies that you represent and write good business for the agencies that you represent. Bradley Flowers, I love you. Thanks, buddy. Guys, you are listening to the Insurance Guys podcast, and we love each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being a part of our family, and we'll see you back here real soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Insurance Guys podcast. If you need to know more about me or you need to get in touch with Scott, you can always reach me at theinsuranceguyonline.com or email me at scott at iprotectinsurance.com. And if you need to get in touch with Mr. Bradley Flowers, go to portalinsurance.com or email him at bradley at portalinsurance.com. Guys, we love you. Thank you so much for listening to our show. 
and being a part of our family. And we look forward to seeing you again next week on the next episode of the Insurance Guys podcast. Take care.